started. So welcome everyone to the first community and world literary series event of spring 2021 hosted by the literature and writing studies department at CSUSM. My name is Courtney Usler and I'm the administrative coordinator for the department. We first want to acknowledge that this virtual event is taking place on the traditional territory and homelands of the Luceno Payom Coisham people. I'm excited to share today's reading will feature creative faculty from the department, professors Sandra Dollar, Francesco Lovato, Andrew Kelly Stewart, Martha Stoddard Holmes, Mark Wallace, and Heidi Brewer. I'll introduce each reader before they speak, and we should have some time for, at the end for questions. We have a packed schedule, so please save your comments for the end and remain muted until we open the Q&A portion of the event. So let's jump in and hear more about our first reader, Sandra Dollar. Sandra is the award-winning author of several books of poetry, prose, and cross-genre text. And she has also co-authored two collaborative books and a translation. The founder and editor of 1913 Press, Sandra's studies include theater, dance, women's studies, film, and book arts. She completed her MFA at the Iowa Writers' Workshop and an MA at the University of Chicago. Before joining CSUSM in 2007, Professor Dollar taught in MFA programs at Holland's, and Boise State. Sandra lives in La Mesa with her partner, their kid, an old dog, and a puppy. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Courtney. That was <laughs> it's really wonderful of you to host us and to organize us in this way. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to connect and to feel connected. Hopefully today, it's also a great opportunity to take our eyes and ears off the impeachment hearing maybe for a little bit moment, um, I don't know. Um, so it's just great to see so many friendly faces in here. And um, I'm just really delighted to have this chance to see you all, to hear from our faculty creative writers today. And, um, oh, Curry. Oh my gosh, so many, and Laura, hi everyone. Um, so I wish I could shout out everyone, but I'm gonna, I have to start my timer because banter counts um, as, as time. So we're gonna try to keep, our readings are gonna be pretty brief today. Um, just a little sample of what we're up to, maybe, maybe some work in progress or, um, you know, work that we're working on or work that we've already published. Um, and um, that way <laughs> we're leaving chance for Q&A at the end because I know we all want to get to the, the place where we can discuss. So that's why our readings are going to be kind of brief. So um, I'm going to read just a couple pieces from a manuscript that I was working on <laughs> before the pandemic hit and um, hope to work on again someday. So I look forward to that time when that kind of work is happening for me. Um, it's called Not Now Now. And that's not a mishearing. That's it's um, it's about um, in some ways motherhood and survival. It's also about mishearing and being heard. And um, as some of you in my uh, current literature and writing two twenty five class might know, we're kind of discussing the way that not only can one word or one phrase um, change the meaning of any given syntactic unit or sentence or um, the sense of a piece, um, but one letter um, can also change that. So you might, um, those of you in my class might be looking for that, might be looking for actual evidence of experimental tactics and procedures. So um, I want to, sh to um, show that <laughs> the processes I make my students do and the hoops I make you jump through are ones that I also use myself as a, as a professional writer. So I'll just read a couple pieces and um, so this is the, I'll read the first couple poems um, in the manuscript that are lineated, um, which means, you know, in lines with line breaks, and then they're interspersed with, with prose poems. They say Credence is the best American band and I am in its pocket now. First of now, or first of may I, Decembered poem in the pile. Movember may be better than June for roasting huck nuts, but soon it's a line like that will get you kicked out of Johnny B's in a hot March. May I make a suggestion? A pill is not 
my name too bad, she said, keep driving the car with no hands and I will surf it something out of it, serve it up good, I sung from the back loud and clingy, hear my hymn. Sometimes I can't look at people on TV. The snug faces, black glasses back at me, a needle pointing, poing into this room. A Cody hung on a chair, sunny faucets, facts on a forehead. I can't bear it up, the watching. Listen, if you don't like what you got, you can sin again against the wing I keep buried. Cover my peepers with your fat buckle so I can't see the newest war, the bear unleashed, the trash covered weather map I wear. I thought a tree dying was a sign of pestilence or terror. You'd done something wrong in your life and so your tree died. But no, sometimes like a pet, they just go. Lifespan different than a dog. How unfair is that? You just get your dog for only this little finger of time and then move on. Whose pets are we? If the lifespan of a tree is significantly longer than ours, does that make us its pet? Like in the concentric circle of lifespans, who wins that contest? And is that how you decided to make God a thing? Who am I asking all these questions of? My mother, I am the mother now and have to come up with answers like the way one letter from the word now to not changes everything. Your breakfast is now ready. Your breakfast is not ready. Why don't we speak typos at the level of the letter? It's when I saw my hand holding the baby's head, I realized I wasn't a baby anymore. I can only imagine what they're talking about in the impeach jar I opened, canned, burnt past recognition of pale muse of what once was. Say to the dying boy, be a man. Is that your answer to the global crisis? Or are we talking more of a striding by the grocery with a kid unhooked in a stroller? How dare you accuse me of domestication? This is the stuff of humanity. Just because you're not in my 51% doesn't make it out of me. If you believe I was made from a pomegranate biter, then I've got another book to sell you. And this one replaces all the pronouns with opposites and middle opposites. And what does that do to your belief then? Does your belief depend on me to open it? Crack that nut like a slow moving rat on the line, does it? And I think I'll, I'll end there. So thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Sandra. Next we have Francesco Lovato, a poet, a literary translator and a new media artist. Recent books include Arsenal Sin Documentos, Endless Beautiful Exact, Elegy for Dead Languages, War Rug, Creaturing as a Translator, and the chapbooks A Continuum of Force and Jettison Collapse. He has collaborated and performed with various composers, including Philip Glass, and his cine poetry has been exhibited in galleries and featured at film festivals in Berlin, Chicago, New York, and elsewhere. He holds an MFA in poetry, a PhD in English studies, and is currently an assistant professor of literature and writing studies at California State University, San Marcos. Thank you, Courtney. Um, uh, so briefly, I'm gonna share my screen um, to try and show you some of the erasers, erasers from the book that I'm gonna be reading from. Um, but quickly, um, I'm gonna be reading from uh, Arsenal Sin Documentos, which is uh, my latest book. It is, a series of documentary poems and erasures that examine uh, the criminalization of migrant bodies at the US border. And it does so through appropriating actual government documents and manuals and, and various texts um, uh, to kind of excavate the language of power inherent in these documents. Um, so hopefully my screen share will work. Um, give me a second here. Okay, is everybody seeing this? Yes. Okay. Um, so these are these series are called policy, um, and this particular one is drawing from the Customs and Border Patrol's uh, use of force policy guidelines, which essentially uh, defines a migrant body based on the levels of resistance uh, to authority and assigns uh, physical harm to those bodies based on that um, level of resistance. Policy one, border critical, this mandate, the authority, the use of tactics, the use of excessive force, this authoritative standard attached as and referenced throughout the body. 
a particular use, the totality of circumstances against the rights of the subject, calculus of reasonableness, an allowance of force, a necessary belief, underlying intent, authorized, imminent, the severity of resisting, the risk of others, policy to force must be objectively reasonable, used where techniques are not sufficient to control, disfigurement, impairment, loss of bodily structure, the limited circumstances, the intent of stopping a person that justifies the use, directed, used to euthanize, to justify, to prevent, the act drawing a weapon, the continuum, a model to gain control, a type of apparent intent to the physical measures taken, a subject, their body, no alternative response. Policy three. For the purposes of, as designated by an individual, justification, armed personnel, authority provided, governed and applicable individually or as a class, the provisions of policy, requirements and standards, this uniformed enforcement specifically approved to carry, to bear around in the chamber, magazine fully loaded, concurrence as operational component, written to obtain respect. Policy four, applicable regulations, concealed and out of view, a weapon overhead, directed, denied, the details of the occurrence, limited to an amount that does not impair a failure to demonstrate requirements, permanent revocation, the commission of an act, the existence of, evidence of, behavior that indicates the individual may be other. Policy seven. Identity of injured, assessment of extent, physical description of any known to have witnessed, the type of firearm, the number of shots, any other information that is needed to assure, chain of command, summary of the incident, the directive, the affair, the limits of reasonable access, a bargaining unit compelled by or through the threat of disciplinary action, requirement to cooperate, the scene, all relevant evidence secured, collected, reported in accordance, the ensuing investigation, geographic jurisdiction where the incident occurred, a violation, a practice, an act of assault, the enforcement of other at the discretion of the local, a deadly force, part of the process, the trauma consistent with operational requirements. Thank you. Thanks, Francesco. Next, we'll hear from Andrew Kelly Stewart, whose writing spans the literary, science fiction, fantasy, and the supernatural genres. His short fiction has appeared in the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction and Ziziva. He is a Clarion Workshop alum and holds an MFA in Creative Writing from San Diego State University. We Shall Sing a Song Into the Deep is his first publication with Tor.com. Stuart teaches and writes in Southern California. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna be reading briefly from, uh, as Courtney mentioned, 
uh, my forthcoming uh, book, We Shall Sing a Song into the Deep, which will be available uh, next month, actually it releases next month um, from uh, tour.com. So it's very exciting. Uh, I won't get into uh, too much about what the book is. It's a, um, but I'll say it's kind of a dark, uh, apocalyptic, um, uh, speculative fiction book. So uh, that's maybe enough to get started with. And I'll be reading from the first chapter. The peel resounds through the boat, through the frame of my bunk. I feel it in my jaw, my teeth, reverberation. And again, Brother Silas knocking the rusty-headed mallet against the hull. The boat is a bell. Three deep resonating tolls. Thong, thong, thong. Waver and fade. Call to matins, the night office. The compartment pitches downward. Weight shifts. Cold toes tingle, alive. The deepest dive of the day, 100 fathoms. Bodies turn, roused from first sleep. Old metal pling, springs plink. Sleepy shapes roll languidly from their bunks. I know them all, even in the dimness. Laszlo, lean and short but strong. Caleb, mousy and frail. St. John with his large knobby head and tall soft padding Ephraim. Stifled coughs, no talking. Silence is observed, must be. I follow, though the belly, though the ache in my belly, though my belly aches to move. More than hunger, I worry for. I know those pangs as I know my own hands. Something else, a two-day malady thus far. But I move, climb down from my bunk, stacked third highest. My toes know their purchase, salt corroded frames, grit grated deck. We don our gunny sack robes in this perennial dusk. One sculpin oil lamp hangs at a tilt from the forward berthing bulkhead. Fat gummed glass, sputter and fishy reek. In a line, we work our way aft, up the main corridor at a slant. No speaking, but we will sing, yes. I commence warming up our voices. My ear tells my throat how to find the key. I always find it. This is one of the reasons why I'm the cantor, the anchoring line. With pitch rooted, the other voices meet it. Step up, step down, two steps up, two steps down, and back to the middle. Our collective hum joins the unending chorus of loud pinging, knocking, clanging. These sounds aren't coming from Brother Silas's hammer, nor the submarine's many machines, which sing their own unending chorus as they work to keep us alive, to keep the boat moving. This is pressure. The weight of the dark sea squeezing the old welds and joints and seals against valves and piping. Our vessel, the Leviathan, its crew, the last of the penitent men on this wicked, ruined earth. We scale aft through the mess, through the galley. No victuals, not until later. Hunger reminds us of where we came from, that poisoned, wicked world above, of our salvation. Up past missile control and the radio room, we join the exodus of brothers leaving their stations, follow them through the hatchway, ducking, descending corroded ladders until at last we gather in the missile compartment, our chapel, the largest single space on the Leviathan. We file down to the lower deck, between the bases of the great red columns. Sixteen of them, eight spaced parallel on either side. Each is forty feet tall, reaching from the lowest recesses of the boat to the top deck. Each is wide, like the pillars I've imagined reading the book of Judges, of Samson, and how, though his hair was shorn from his head by the betrayer, and though he was powerless and blinded, he still toppled the temple of Dagon. They once held his fire, these pillars, each one, and when he spoke, Kaplan listened, unleashed each, those first days of tribulation. One remains, one missile, the last judgment. I think I'll end it there, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. Up next, we have Martha Stoddard Holmes who earned her MA in creative writing at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she studied with poets Edward Dorn and Bruce Cowan and fiction writers Robert Steiner and Ron Sukunik. Her recent creative nonfiction on cancer and metaphor appears in Literature and Medicine, Genre and Post Road. Body Without Organs was nominated for a Pushcart Prize. She's working on a graphic narrative of ovarian cancer. She loves to teach the creative writing process and facilitate one class final paper retreats featuring mindful drawing and writing.
And as all my students know, it takes me a while to get unmuted, but then it's hard to get me muted again. So thank you so much for everyone for making this happen. Sandra, Francesco, Courtney, and my faculty colleagues, and a particular shout out to my drawing partner, Heidi Brewer. So this is, um, this is a definitely a work in progress. And um, I'll just say that this is about something that happened, gosh, almost 20 years ago that had a very fortunate outcome. So I'll just uh, begin from here. I'm hoping you can see my screen. That's in case I forget my name. Okay. LA convention. It was December 2002. I tried on my black jeans. I couldn't get them zipped no matter what. Had I been eating lots? Was this menopause? Was I suddenly old? I was 47. Shoot. <laughs> I wore other jeans to the convention. Then I went back home, taught my classes, did family things. But in the middle of the night, I discovered a new sensation, like pressing up against a table edge. But this edge was inside, pressing my belly out, a ledge. I expected to see a ridge break the surface like a movie alien. It felt like after surgery, when you realize you are made of flesh, tissue that can be folded, sewn, stretched, snipped. I felt afraid in my skin. Losing track of the ledge, I shifted my body to find it again like feeling for a loose tooth. I held very still, waiting on the ledge. Hi, I'm Dr. B, so lovely to meet you. Dr. B was elegant and kind. She didn't ask why I had waited so long. Does this hurt? I'm feeling some masses on your ovaries, probably cysts. Where are my ovaries exactly? I want to schedule an ultrasound this week. Thank you so much. I had a vague idea of the ovaries. Where did I learn this? We saw a Walt Disney movie in school today. That's nice. What was it about? Menstruation, the story of you and your amazing eggs. The ultrasound was on a Friday afternoon before a long weekend. My husband took my son north for a ski race. The lab was nearly empty. I told myself it was just a routine check. Do you have any family history of ovarian cancer? No. I waited to get my images for a Tuesday morning appointment with a gynecological oncologist, Dr. D. At home, I held the film up to the screen and tried to read the images. And that's it. That's all. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Martha. And up next, we have Mark Wallace, the author and editor of more than 15 books and chapbooks of poetry, fiction, and essays. Most recently, he has published a novel, Crab, and a book length prose poem, Notes from the Center on Public Policy. Selections of his multi-part long poem, The End of America, which he has been writing since 2005, have been published in several chapbooks and a number of journals. His current novel, 
Sir Sleepy of the Bunny Nest, A Saga of the Revolution, is an ongoing serial appearing on a fugitive Tumblr blog. He lives in San Diego, California. Courtney, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's great to be here with everybody, my colleagues, and so many students that I recognize and some uh, that I don't. Um, but So welcome to everybody. And uh, this is a lot of fun, a great way to gather. Um, uh, and thanks especially to Courtney for really uh, bringing all of us together and making this work. Um, I, I don't consider myself a songwriter, although I've uh, written some songs that have been performed by several different bands over the years. Um, the following poem, which I, I wrote this last summer, was turned into a song anyway fairly shortly thereafter by a artist and poet living in Racine, Wisconsin. Um, I met Dan in fall of 2010 when I was uh, uh, giving on a reading tour for my then just released book, uh, uh, The Quarry and a Lot. Um, and, you know, I have to say that meeting interesting people when I'm traveling giving readings is one of the reasons I love traveling to give readings for my work. And Dan is an example of just the kind of person I would never have met if I hadn't uh, been on the road doing that sort of thing. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what this very simple poem is called because you're gonna know in just a second. I get up early, there's nowhere to go. I've got the pandemic blues. People coughing to the right of me, gasping to the left. They've got the pandemic blues. Wearing no mask in the grocery store, he screams at the people bagging his food. He's got the pandemic blues. They keep rolling in the hospital doors where the doctors and nurses never go home. They're fighting the pandemic blues. Federal agents roaming the streets, shooting and planting fake evidence. This can't be the pandemic blues. Can't go out, don't wanna stay home. Say, have you got the pandemic blues? Government men say go back to work. Businessmen say it too. They don't care who catches the pandemic blues. People die surrounded by strangers. No one can even come to their graves. Things don't end well with the pandemic blues. Will there ever be a cure and how will we be able to trust it? Nothing is sure in the pandemic blues. You used to see me and I used to see you. No one sees no one with the pandemic blues. I sit at home and look out the window, watch the sun crash red towards the sea. Another day gone in the pandemic blues. So that's the uh, first of two pieces I'm going to uh, uh, read today. The second one has uh, uh, just a little uh, preface. Um, uh, so, and some of my colleagues and uh, other people I know know this about me, but uh, many people don't. Um, but many generations of the men in my family have been ministers, not all of them, but uh, quite a few. Um, the man after whom I'm named, Marcus Judiah Wallace, uh, was the founding minister of the First Presbyterian Hope uh, Church in Hope, Arkansas in the 19th century. Um, and that's the church that later became known for being uh, President Bill Clinton's church during the years when he was the governor of Arkansas. Um, my father, uh, uh, who, as some of you might know, recently uh, passed away, um, was a licensed minister also, although he made his career as a historian of religion and only preached now and then as a guest of a number of different churches and institutions. Uh, ministers are people too, of course, uh, and have as many foibles as any other person. Uh, one of the things that people sometimes don't realize is that many ministers are also writers. Uh, sermons may often be about trying to understand the will of God, but they have to be written by someone, people, right? A friend of mine who's a minister at an Episcopalian church in McLean, Virginia, um, when she has to write the Sunday sermon once or twice a month, uh, she disappears into her room all Friday and Saturday uh, to get the sermon written. Um, I spent quite a few Saturdays over the years hanging out with her husband, also a longtime friend, while she's at her desk uh, writing a Sunday sermon. Um, the following little story, uh, neither entirely true or entirely fictional, uh, is based on someone I knew for a while, not well, and who uh, thankfully was not a member of my family. Um, the story is part of a little collection of mine of what are called synoptic novels. Uh, these are short narratives that in a few lines try to cover the range that usually requires a whole book. Um, and some of my students in my 425 class will have some a synoptic novel prompt uh, later on this semester. Um, 
The story has a very simple title. It's called Minister. A minister living in a small Midwestern city develops tastes more expensive than he can manage on his salary. A man with a boisterous laugh and a hearty desire to experience life, his eloquent literary sermons make him popular with his congregation. In fact, he is greeted and welcomed throughout the city. He lives a flamboyant social life involving fancy dinners with businessmen and politicians, and he has brief, discreet affairs with a number of attractive women. After buying a big house in town, a vacation home in Florida, and expensive furniture for both, as well as numerous cars and a boat, he finds himself dangerously in debt. He begins embezzling church funds. Given his good reputation, he succeeds for a while before the missing money is noticed. He is arrested and sentenced to two years in prison. While in prison, he comes to know many inmates, petty thieves, white collar criminals like himself, even a few murderers and gang members. His experiences with them are sometimes dangerous, but also expose him to the struggles live behind the walls of American prisons. He has time to look back on his past and regret the foolish criminal behavior that ruined his life as a minister. During his jail term, he writes a book about his crimes and his prison experiences. Soon after he serves his sentence, he finds an agent and a publisher. When the book is published, it sells well. Since not surprisingly, there are many people who want to read about an embezzling womanizing minister humbled by jail time. However, it's not the sort of book that makes the ex-minister vastly rich or famous. It needs a lot of promotion. And the ex-minister turned writer travels to many bookstores to discuss his experiences and sign the book. With his charismatic public presence, his, he garners consistent interest. He finds that promoting his book is not all that different from preaching. Soon he develops a tightly wrought public relations pitch in which he tells engaging stories about his jail experiences and dramatizes his own repentance. It helps, he sees, to develop a persona. Soon the minister gone wrong and the minister from the dark side become a crucial part of the advertising for both his first book and then his second, a murder novel with a church-based setting published quickly to capitalize on his probably temporary notoriety. His books are criticized by many religious leaders, but that only gains him more readers and more attention. Soon, part of his public relations pitch suggests that his books highlight the hypocrisy of religion and are works that, quote, America's powerful religious leaders don't want you to read. A widely distributed photograph shows him with a glass of wine raised in the air, toasting his friends, and by implication taunting the narrow anti-love of life perspective of American Protestantism. After all, he tells himself, some Americans love religion and others hate it, but all Americans love a healthy, life-affirming thief who thumbs his nose at uptight, narrow-minded authority. So uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, Mark. And our final reader today will be Heidi Brewer. Heidi's been teaching at the college level since she started her MA in 1995. And she's been a professor since 2003, first at Wright State University in Ohio, and then at CSUSM since 2007. Her original training is in medieval and Renaissance British literature, grounded in an intersectional feminist and sexuality studies perspective. But her interests have branched out quite a bit since then to include speculative fiction, comics, graphic fiction, and popular culture studies more generally, especially neo-medievalism. She's always been interested in monsters and marginalized figures, and that interest has carried through to today. Her previous publications, including parts of her book, Crafting the Witch, Gendering Magic in Medieval and Early Modern England, are examples of personal criticism or autobiographical criticism. Personal criticism mixes scholarly and creative approaches to textual analysis. It's a hybrid genre in which literary analysis integrates with elements of memoir and creative nonfiction. Making the shift to creative work seemed only natural as it marries her recent work in speculative fiction and comics to her original fascination with monstrous figures in productive and surprising ways. 
Thank you, Courtney. Thank you so much. Um, I thank you for organizing and thanks to all of my colleagues who've gone before me. I'm so excited to be here with my literature writing colleagues at CSUSM for my debut, my first professional reading of my creative work publicly, which is very exciting to me. I'm so inspired by everyone else's work and so pleased to be included in this reading. The two pieces I'm presenting to you today are from a newer project. Uh, my groove is normally speculative fiction, fantasy mostly, but in addition to that, I've also been working on a graphic memoir for the past couple of years, and I want to shout back out to my writing, my drawing and writing partner, Martha Southern Holmes. Um, it's been really wonderful to have someone to work on. See, students, I tell you, form a writing group, and I did the same thing, practicing what I preach. All right. <laughs> the first piece that I will share with you today explains what my memoir is about, so I won't spoil it for you. My students also know I hate spoilers. Um, my first piece is very, very much still in a draft form. And then the second piece is a little bit further along. It's actually in kind of a preliminary comic layout. Although my materials are very modest as I'm developing my cartooning repertoire right now. So finally, I am so especially pleased to have my brothers and their spouses here through the magic of Zoom. They live on the East Coast. And so I'm especially grateful that they're able to be here today as well. So thank you all. Okay, let me share my screen. Are you seeing my screen? Oh, no, not yet. Hang on. Yeah, Courtney and not. Okay, great. Perfect. Wonderful. So the first piece is called Your Mother. One thing that everyone knows about your mother is that you should love her. Everyone knows that. It's common sense. So when you have the audacity to admit that you don't love your mother, things get real. And if you make the unfortunate mistake of confessing that you actually kind of hate your mother, well, let's just say it never turns out well. Oops. All right. There we go. I kind of hate my mother. You don't really hate hate her though. It can't be that bad. I don't know why you let her bother you. She just makes me laugh. On the rare occasion when someone asks you why you hate your mother and you answer honestly, things get, what's the word I'm looking for? Complicated. When you tell someone your mother was abusive, you must expect certain reactions. These reactions are disappointingly consistent, a reliable series of steps you can count on. Step one, they stop smiling. Step two, they look down, unwilling to meet your eyes, unwilling to believe, unwilling to see. Step three, they dismiss you. You can see the dismissal rising up, the assumption that you're being dramatic, that you're exaggerating, remembering wrong. You can see them thinking, not really. I mean, she wasn't really abusive. Your mom was just disciplining you. It was a different time back then. Your mom was practicing tough love. Spare the rod and spoil the child. You can see them searching for a way to reconcile what you just said with their unshakable belief that mothers are innately loving and compassionate, that something about your story must be wrong. And that leads to the last step. They blame you. After you tell them how bad it was, that the abuse was real and ongoing and traumatic, they ask you, with love and compassion in their eyes. Can't you just be more patient? Can't you just try to remember the good things instead of the bad? Can't you just show a little more compassion? Can't you just love her anyway? Can't you just let it go? Can't you just forgive her? Can't you just be the better person? When you answer truthfully, no, they rest their case. When your mother abuses you, you learn 
that it was your fault. All right, that was the first one. The second one is called Doritos. And um, <clears throat> so this is the one where I'm gonna be showing you pictures. So I'm not gonna be talking as much on this one. I will read the dialogue. Doritos. So the way I read comics is I look at the entire page, like two pages first, and then I kind of go in and I look at each of the frames and then I step back and look at the whole comic again. Bong, 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 bong. Would she be happy or more likely angry? Quick, clean up the living room. I've got the laundry. Boys, come and help with the groceries. How was your day, Mom? Honey, I found the best dinner at Publix tonight. Ground turkey and Cool Ranch Doritos. Sizzle. You scoop it. This was a good night. Thank you very much. Good job, Heidi. <laughs> Thanks, my brother. Way to go. Great. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you to all of our readers. We'll go ahead and move into the Q&A section now. So if you want to, uh, you can raise your hand using the reactions function in Zoom, or you can type your questions in the chat. And while we're waiting for people to raise their hands with questions, uh, do you guys as readers want to speak to what inspired you to write these pieces? Yeah, as everyone knows, we can just we can just talk. <laughs> we're professors. We're we're good at that. But we'd love to take any questions you all have. And yeah, I don't know if um, I'm curious about Martha and and Heidi. Um, you say you're drawing partners, and Heidi, you encourage your students to form groups, as I know many of us do. 
<clears throat> to work together and collaborate or just be supportive partners to each other in the process. So what is what is that process like, um, Martha and Heidi, you're, do you sit together and draw or to kind of share and give feedback or? Um, I don't want to interrupt Martha if she's trying to put herself off mute, but I, I want to say that I don't know that I would have had the courage to participate in the reading if Martha and I hadn't been working on these stories together. <laughs> Her support and also the practice of just having a, a dedicated person to be held accountable to like, this is drawing time. Exactly. It's support and accountability combined, which is that that perfect chatter, chatting, you know, animals emerge and you know we get cups of tea so it's i highly recommend it and it's been very generative for both of us <laughs> and i see we have catherine with a question catherine go ahead hi sorry if i sound a little nervous i'm not that's a pretty big group so um my career, what I want to do with my career is, um, I love comics. I grew up on them. I grew up on superheroes and, um, I have a best friend who lives where, um, I am. I live on a reservation. I'm native American and she draws and that's her passion. And I write, I'm an okay doodler. I'm not the best artist, but when I was, um, it's more of a comment than a question, but when I was listening to Heidi's piece, um, I just, I remembered a friend and all those phrases were really, really familiar to what I heard people say to her. And it was like really intense to hear that. And it was beautiful. Like the whole thing, like the pictures and everything was, I'm sorry, I'm really emotional right now. Um, you touched me in a place that I didn't expect to be touched today. So um, it was really good. And I'm glad that I came to this. and. Hi, teacher. <laughs> I, I missed it a lot, though. Okay, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing. And I see Maria Angela has her hand up, too. Yeah, um, that was great. Thank you, guys. This um, question is for Sandra. I really liked your poem, and Thanks. I was curious about, like, I really like the, the rhythm of it. And I noticed that, like, at the beginning, it kind of started slow, and then you made, like, a change. I was just wondering, like, what inspired you to kind of do that, like, shift to make that, like, change in the rhythm of the poem? Yeah, great, great question. Thank you, Maria Angela. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I tend to read, when I read, um, I think I held up at the beginning, I didn't share my screen because I'm not that <laughs> official with that, but so I read some lineated work, so with line breaks and then um, two pieces with line breaks and then two pieces that were in block, prose blocks. Oh, yeah. And um, so that was the shift that you really um, astutely noticed there. And I tend to read prose in kind of a fast, almost out of breath sort of, fashion um, because that's how it feels to me is it's kind of more of a rush whereas the enjambment and line break in a lineated poem has a has a, a built-in pause and those are very um, um, conscious and attended to moments of breaking inside the poem so I give those more space and that's definitely something um, I work with students on and have thought about as a writer myself is not only how work is presented on the page how we, um, you know, do it, it's very different when we lineate a poem versus when we have something in prose or um, with the comics when we have a visual or some or a cross out, you know, when there's a visual attached to it. So those all um, are things that wor we work with as writers and as artists who are working, you know, in between different kind of art forms. Um, but also as, as a poet, it's something that I've, um, not struggled with, but have had different engagements with over time is performance. Um, I come from a performance background, which just means that I like maybe am more attached to performance in some way. So I've become more kind of conscious of performance moments than I'd love to hear about um, everyone else's um, performance aspects in your work too, if people wanna to touch on that. But I do think a lot about how I'm presenting something um, 
and I talk to students about that. How do we use the microphone? Where does our voice go? Does it go up here? Does it go down here? You know, even just little things that you can control and things that you can't control. Um, those all become part of the performance. So I, I appreciate your note, um, your comment and your question. That was really cool. Thank you for that. Um, and thanks for the visual. I feel like when I could see like the beginning and then the end, I was just like that wider chunk. Um, really makes sense. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, I encourage you to to think about that in your own work and, and work with that maybe. Since yeah, like how you see, like, to it. the little things that you can control actually are huge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, totally. totally. Great, great comment. Thank you so much. Thanks. Great, and I think next is Jenna. Yeah, hi. Um, so, so sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, um, is, um, Heidi and Martha, uh, your readings, um, just because I'm in a Professor Dollar's class and I'm one of those people that's like, I'm not a creative person. I'm gonna suck at this creative writing class. I'm a very like, logic focus person. So my whole life, I've really depended on other people's writing to explain how I'm feeling and using poetry to put my thoughts into words. Your experiences growing up. Um, and so, no, sorry, now I'm getting emotional. Uh, not being able to feel like I can put my experience into words, being able to like hear your experience in words and then be able to say like, that's me, that's what I wanna be able to say. And like, that's my experience. And that's like what I've been through and to like hear that someone else has been through those experiences. And I imagine um, that um, Martha, a lot of people might feel that way about your work as well. Um, they're just both such like personal, personal vulnerable experiences. And so I just really applaud the ability to make that um, such a public and um, cathartic thing, I think for probably both writer and audience. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much for your vulnerability today. Thank you for that, Jenna. Awesome. Um, and next we have Ariel. Hello. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment that, um, like Jenna said, these pieces are very vulnerable. I can see that you guys put a lot of effort into your pieces and it, it just kind of puts into perspective that you guys are not only our professors but you guys are people that have these have had these experiences and on top of that it's it, it spoke out to me because especially during these um especially during the pandemic um I really don't know you guys and just hearing these vulnerable stories it just kind of like put me into perspective i'm like wow you guys have been through through a lot um and i see that the creativity that um that you guys have you guys are very very talented um i just i also have a question for uh professor dollar um she was talking about um about motherhood and the line that spoke out to me that is that she wasn't a baby anymore because she was holding that baby. That spoke out to me a lot. And now, especially during um, the pandemic, I just wanted to know if um, her point of view has changed, like has your point of view changed ever since the pandemic started on like how you view uh, motherhood? Uh, wow, Erla, thank you, thank you so much, Ariel, for um, <laughs> for bringing that up. It was like perfectly timed because my my kids started chattering right behind me, right at <laughs> right at that moment. So I thought we might get a zoom, an internal zoom bomb um, from her. But um, so that happens. <laughs> Pretty much every zoom I have, I think, seems like an invitation. Do you want to come say hi? <laughs> say hi. hi. <laughs> so every every Zoom is an invitation to um, to vomit. Being a writer and a mother, what do you, what do you think about that? Do I <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this is my object lesson here. Um, it's the pandemic has definitely been, you know, such a challenge. I mean, there, there was, you know, everyone has, we all have our 
life experiences that we bring into our profession um, as writers, as professors, um, and you know, every profession we have, we don't leave our lives on the shelf. And so I think um, that actually in some ways being transparent about that, which I see actually as a through line in everyone's work here, is just being open and vulnerable and honest about um, our life paths and our struggles can actually um, invite our, our student writers who then go on often to become professional writers or work in different professions um, to just embrace um, a holistic view of, of your own work. So technically, uh, writing time has gotten very, you know, like there's no school like in San Diego. You know, we don't have a school right now, but, but I know that everyone has their own, you know, struggles. So um, that would be my, that would be my very discombobulated answer is that things are, are really kind of loose and untethered um, for everyone. And um, for mothers, I think in a really specific way that will probably impact my writing in the future, but that I was already there. <laughs> so I was already thinking about these things. And I think a lot of us might not know how this last year and going forward um, is really gonna impact our work, our creative work, our professional lives. There's so much uncertainty in all of that. And I think that's one thing that we really can share with each other and, and honesty about that, I think is really important. So thank you, Ariel. Thank you. And I just wanna be respectful of everyone's time. We are at one o'clock. So thank you to everyone for joining us for this amazing event. And we can stick around for a few minutes if somebody has additional comments. Um, but yes, thank you all for coming and, and for being present with us while we shared our work. Thank you for Heidi, help, I mean, for Courtney helping us organize it. And thank you to all my colleagues for sharing their work with us. Uh, it was really nice to get together and be able to just, you know, kind of read together. Um, I look forward to just being able to do it actually in person at some point too. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much. And what he said, exactly. <laughs> thank you, Francesco. <laughs> yeah, thank you to everyone for agreeing to read. It can be such a, um, you know, reading on Zoom is not, <laughs> it's not always ideal, but it's ideal in that we got to invite people from a distance and see, you know, people we haven't seen in a while. So thank you to everyone for coming. So exciting to see uh, to see people we haven't seen in a long time. So like Curry Mitchell. I'm looking oh. at you, Curry Mitchell. <laughs> 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 yeah. I and and those who want to hang out can hang out. I think we have the Zoom room open for a little bit longer if people want to chat more or if there were more um, questions or discussion things. I don't know, Courtney, what you what you think, but um I think the meeting is definitely uh, paring down in terms of participants. So anybody who's here yeah. who has questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to just chat. Yeah. Cool. Laura. Real, real quick, uh, Courtney, how many did we have? Oh, um, I believe it was up to 127 at one point. Yeah. Very wow. exciting. Oh. Very exciting. <laughs> Great to see you all. I miss you all so much. Yes, it's so nice to see people. Yeah. Yeah. Great to see you. That's super good to see everybody. And I wish we were in person. Um, I just want to share really fast. Another through line is, um, is just this sort of all these pieces are in process. You know, and I really appreciate it. even Heidi, you giving us your reading process into a comic book, right? Like that was my experience of your piece. And Mark earlier saying, you know, even something finished can one day be something else like a song, you know, and, you know, the, the redacting of, of reports that were for one thing become poetry in another space. And so that's really helpful for me right now in where we are. Uh, and I, and I think Sandra, this, this connects with what you were just saying that like, really embracing a process and being transparent about process is so beautiful in form, 
right in in a product and to see that shift in and out of that process so i really i gained a lot from this and in addition to seeing everybody so um, thank you thank you for this this is great Thank you, Curry. Thank you for coming back to see us <laughs> in space. I want to know. I was just looking at Courtney and I were kind of exchanging link about the podcast that you're you're doing right now, which sounds really or you've been doing for a while on campus. Your campus sounds amazing. Yeah, we I, we're actually I I got a scoot in a minute to go record another episode. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I hope actually we get more controversial. That that's I think that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an exciting teaser we will we will check it out Perfect. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah well I, again really great to see and i can't wait till we're all back in a space together we can chat and hang out so thank you totally and, and though we've never met curry I, I would like to find some way to rent your bookshelf as a zoom background because that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I have just like a window behind me, so I've got to put backdrops in. <laughs> it's such an accident. I'm actually freezing my butt off in my garage right now. <laughs> Admit it, Curry. You pay for that service where you buy like books by the foot, and then you just put them behind right. you. <laughs> oh, it's, it's actually random shit. Is all it is. It just. <laughs> It's visually you're, very you're pleasing. You're blocking the random part, so it but, looks like books. <laughs> books and.